Uh, the last line that you interrupted was that I would talk till about six, if I can constrain myself, and then we'll uh, have some discussion. That was the end of the introduction. Uh, <laughs> so you got to know not to clap too soon, bad timing. <laughs> uh, when the uh, El Salvador situation began to uh, hit the front pages uh, some time ago, there was an article in the Washington Post by Don Oberdorfer, one of their correspondents, a very good one, in which he made the following comment. He said, Americans who had had little experience in the area went to war in ignorance of Vietnam's history, speaking of Indochina. One wonders in this respect, where are the popular histories of El Salvador and Central America, of Angola and Namibia, of the Persian Gulf, to name a few? Will it take a new disaster to produce them? Will they, too, be 20 years too late? Uh, well, you partially got an answer already. The uh, Esrick has already published one. Uh, but think a little bit about Oberdorfer's comment, which is uh, a fairly uh, standard one. On the, it's, uh, on the surface, it's quite, quite plausible. For example, 25 years have passed since the American-backed coup, which uh, turned Guatemala into a literal hell on earth about uh, uh, in 1954, uh, more than 25 years. And the first book, um, first books on the subject are just beginning to appear now, an interesting fact and an informative one, and one can mention many other examples. Uh, so there's something quite plausible about the comment, uh, and it's a popular view, particularly among people who call themselves doves. It's commonly argued, I'm sure you've heard this said about Vietnam any number of times, that we went to war in ignorance of Vietnam's history and we lacked the proper experience and knowledge and understanding. Uh, Incidentally, the people who make this comment uh, and deplore our lack of experience and understanding usually do not have in mind the suffering of the people of Indochina or Central America uh, when they talk about this uh, lack of experience and understanding that, that uh, they deplore. Well, when a uh, view is popular and uh, positively uh, regarded in the media, uh, a, a sort of a reasonable person will begin to become skeptical and will ask why it's popular. Why this concern for American inexperience and uh, ignorance about Indochina and Central America? Uh, there's something a little funny about it, and uh, I want to begin by commenting on it because I think uh, it leads into a trap into which we all, me included, uh, uh, tend to fall. And the meeting today can almost not fail to lead us into that trap. Uh, uh, as I say, it superficially seems obvious. We should want to know about El Salvador and Indochina before, before we become involved in such areas. On the other hand, notice that when we talk, say, about official enemies, we don't talk in those terms. For example, if we want to understand, uh, say, Russian aggression, uh, we don't uh, try to, we don't look up uh, textbooks on the history of Afghanistan and Czechoslovakia. Uh, that's not where we find out things about Russian policy in those areas. Uh, and in fact, we don't deplore the fact that the Soviet Union is ignorant of the surrounding areas uh, and lacks proper experience concerning, say, Czechoslovakia and Afghanistan and so on. Uh, in fact, what we look for is not histories of Afghanistan and Czechoslovakia, but rather histories of the Soviet Union. And at the same time, we deny them properly any right to gain the experience uh, that uh, they, in fact, lack in these areas that leads to their errors and blunders. Uh, uh, the reason for this is perfectly obvious, and if we have even minimal uh, standards of, of honesty and moral courage, we will apply the same lesson to ourselves. Uh, that, incidentally, is remarkable, remarkably difficult, uh, but nevertheless, it should be done. In the case at hand, what does it mean? Well, I think what it means is pretty obvious. That is that the sort of wailing about American inexperience and ignorance concerning places like Vietnam and El Salvador, that's a popular line. Uh, because uh, if you think about it for a minute, you see that it incorporates an implicit assumption that we have the right or maybe even the duty to uh, intervene by force if we only know what we're up to. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's very serious that we sort of lack the experience and understanding. On the other hand, nobody would ever say this, say, about the Russians in Afghanistan uh, because they don't have that right. They don't have that unique right that we do possess to carry out forceful intervention in the affairs of other people because of our unique benevolence and so on and so forth. Uh, 
A second thing about this popular view uh, is that it deflects attention from the real source of the problems of Indochina and Central America, which is not so much in Saigon or in San Salvador as it is in Washington and New York and American universities, uh, to mention a few examples. And it also deflects attention from the systematic behavior of the United States in world affairs, which tends to be masked when we focus attention on one or another special case, uh, at the same time displacing the problem from here where it is to there where the victims are. Uh, in many ways, I think it's the United States itself that is the most remote and unfamiliar region uh, to us. And I think it's fair to say that our ideological system is designed to ensure that this uh, state of affairs continues. Well, uh, notice that when we devote a meeting to El Salvador, we're already falling into that trap. True, we should understand what's going on in El Salvador and Central America, but even more significant, we should understand what's going on in Washington and New York uh, and American institutions that are involved in creating the problems uh, that now exist in those regions. That's what we should understand, uh, and we should understand it not only with regard to El Salvador, but with regard to many other areas. And we should also bear in mind, maybe this is obvious, that when we're talking about El Salvador, we're not talking about ancient Sumer. We're talking about something that's happening now, something that we have a large degree of responsibility for, and correspondingly that we can do a lot to change, uh, to come and you know, give a talk or listen to a meeting or something of that sort is uh, in a way morally outrageous uh, when one thinks that uh, massacres are being perpetrated, that we're directly responsible for it and we're not doing anything much about it. Well, that's the really important thing and in a certain sense I ought to stop there. But since the, uh, uh, you know, the sort of uh, the formal arrangements are that I'm supposed to keep talking, let me go on. Uh, about... Uh, uh, if you turn outside the United States, the concept that there's sort of something systematic about American behavior is less, is, uh, is less exotic and, in fact, uh, much more widely understood, and it's sometimes put in uh, rather striking ways. For example, uh, Jose Arevalo, who was the uh, sort of leading nationalist figure in Guatemala up until the time uh, 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 when the United States put an end to the Guatemalan experiment with democracy, uh, he once made the following comment which merits some thought. Uh, he, speaking of, I think he was speaking of Latin America, but he put it more generally. He said, the Nazis lost World War, World War II, but in the ideological dialogue between the two worlds and the two leaders, Roosevelt lost the war. The real victor was Hitler. It is my personal opinion that the contemporary world is moved by the ideas that served as the foundation on which Hitler rose to power. Uh, I think that there's... Uh, fair amount of truth to that remark. Uh, in fact, if some Rip Van Winkle were to have fallen asleep uh, in the 1930s, or the early 1940s, and were to awaken today and were to travel around Latin America, uh, he would conclude, undoubtedly, that Hitler had, in fact, won the war, that Nazi Germany had won the war. Uh, and again, we have a very significant uh, responsibility and have played a large role in bringing about that state of affairs. Uh, and more important, again, it lies within our power to rectify it. Well, I'd like to read you something about how the same scene looks uh, uh, on the, from the point of view of someone who played a role in helping create it and now apparently regrets it, uh, uh, namely a, uh, a rather interesting article that appeared in the Los Angeles Times by uh, a man named Charles Machling, who was the head of the counterinsurgency and internal defense planning for Presidents Kennedy and Johnson from 1961 to 1966, uh, as he points out correctly here, but let me stress it, he came into the position of head of counterinsurgency planning at the time when the United States changed, when the, Pentag when the American government changed its uh, basic sort of theoretical framework, if you like, or its strategy with regard to military assistance to uh, Latin America. Up until then, the uh, justification for military assistance had been hemispheric defense, although it's not entirely obvious when you think about it who the hemisphere had to defend itself from, or maybe it is obvious, but not what they had in mind. Uh, but uh, at that point, in 19, around 1960 and 1961, 
uh, the concept was changed from hemispheric defense to internal security. Uh, and uh, Maechling was involved right at that point, 1961, and that had enormous effects on Latin America. Let me read you the way he describes it now. In the space of two years, this is writing last March, nearly 25,000 people have been killed in El Salvador, not in combat or caught in crossfire, but tortured, mutilated, and butchered in cold blood. Every night, men, women, men and women are dragged from their homes by armed men. Every morning, their mutilated corpses turn up in roadside ditches and garbage dumps. In the last 60 days, 400 to 800 villagers have been massacred. In Guatemala, whole villages of Indians and a wide spectrum of the intelligentsia, journalists, teachers, social workers, students, and doctors, have been killed in political violence. Who is killing the people of Central America and why? All reputable sources with first-hand knowledge, the Roman Catholic Church, the Red Cross, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the Organization of American States, Human Rights Commission, Amnesty International, our own former ambassadors all tell the same story. A small number are certainly being killed by the rebels, but guerrillas have no vehicles, and the bodies turn up either after motorized sweeps by the security forces or after visits by, by masked men in vehicles who circulate freely through roadblocks and shoot first curfews. These atrocities are not just a tragic byproduct of civil war, nor are they accidental. Not understood by the American public and concealed by the Reagan administration, and in fact its predecessors, we may add, uh, is that the Latin American military, Salvadoran, Guatemalan, or Argentine, routinely employs terror to exterminate guerrillas and insurgency movements. Devised by the Nazis for occupied Europe, perfected by Argentina, and now passed from hand to hand by Latin, America, by Latin military staffs, the strategy involves torture and murder of anyone suspected of association with subversives. Guilt or innocence is immaterial. The object is to exterminate the opposition and by cowing sympathizers into submission, deprive the guerrillas of support, key phrase. Uh, in their endless quest for stability south of the border, U.S. administrations repeatedly turn a blind eye to the rapacity and cruelty of the Latin American military. Not until 1961, however, Kennedy administration, was there direct complicity as opposed to occasional direct interventions by the U.S. government in aiding domestic repression in Latin America. In that year, under pressure from the Pentagon, the Latin American military role was changed from hemispheric defense to internal security. Uh, U.S. assistance programs were retooled to strengthen the hold of the local military forces over their own people. For 20 years, the Pentagon has lavished training and equipment on the Latin American military, both at bases in the United States and at the U.S. Army School of the Americas in the Panama, former Panama Canal Zone. Under the guise of civic action programs, Latin American officers have been encouraged to meddle in government and civilian affairs. There has been little screening to read out the drug racketeers and war criminals and no indoctrination in civilized standards of warfare. Senior officers indistinguishable from the war criminals hanged at Nuremberg after World War II have passed through the Inter-American Defense College in Washington. Neither in training programs nor thereafter does the Pentagon insist on compliance with the Geneva Conventions regarding humane treatment of prisoners and non-combatants. Equipment is given without strings. For the United States, which led the crusade against Nazi evil to support the methods of Heinrich Himmler's extermination squads, is an outrage. It is also counterproductive. Unless mass killing stops, the tide of violence will inundate the whole of Central America. These comments are accurate as far as they go and are interesting because of the source, which I identified. Uh, they don't, however, go really far enough. It's probably incorrect to say that the United States simply does not uh, insist upon humane treatment of uh, the population and so on. There's evidence, shocking but uh, nevertheless significant, that the American military training uh, specifically uh, uh, is designed specifically towards assisting in these goals of exterminating the opposition and cowing sympathizers into submission, which will, of course, involve torture, brutality, you know, high technology torture, which the United States and its allies have introduced into the region in the past 20 years that he's talking about and so on. Uh, furthermore, uh, the, the, even though Maechling is, in fact, talking about the systematic behavior of the United States, the description is still, unfortunately, too narrow. Uh, if you go back farther, uh, or look more broadly, you find that there are similar things to say and have been elsewhere in the world. For example, in 1947, uh, the United States became engaged in the first major post-war counterinsurgency uh, 
campaign, namely in Greece, and incidentally with regard to that, the first book has also, the first serious book has also just come out in the last few months. Uh, and uh, 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 that makes very, should, should, you should read it. I'm thinking of Lawrence Whitner's book on American intervention in Greece, which is the first really serious account of what the United States did in its military intervention in Greece in the late 1940s under the completely fabricated guise of defending democracy from the Soviet Union, which was uh, involved only in the sense that it was trying to call off the Greek guerrillas. Uh, the United States entered after the British were unable to subdue the Greek uh, resistance, uh, and uh, the, the American military command was responsible for a campaign of incredible brutality, uh, which led to tens of thousands of people being permanently exiled, tens of thousands of more being sent to prison islands and re-education camps where they were subjected to political execution and torture. Uh, the, uh, every effort on the part of the Greeks who didn't, weren't particularly gung-ho about massacring each other, every effort at reconciliation was aborted by the U.S. military mission, which wanted to ensure that the mass base of the guerrillas would be wiped out, would be exterminated, so that it would then be possible to have what are called elections. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, there's nothing like a well-planned and effective massacre to lay the basis for successful elections. Uh, we've seen another case of that recently. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the end result of this was uh, to turn, was, uh, it, it succeeded after you know, vast destruction, massacre, torture, uh, execution, re, you know, political re-education, etc. Uh, and the impact on Greece has really uh, never ha has ha has never been overcome to this day. Uh, now, uh, this was a kind of a model. It's a kind of a model which has been applied over and over again in the Third World. Uh, in Greece and typically elsewhere, uh, the United States found itself in a position where it was like the British, in fact, let's go back a step. The British conquered Greece from its own population. Uh, they did not conquer Greece from the Nazis. The Nazis had already withdrawn from Greece before the British army landed. Uh, the British conquered Greece from its own population, tried to restore a regime of uh, Nazi collaborators and royalists, uh, and to destroy the anti-Nazi resistance, which had held down about 300,000 German troops and was quite effective. Uh, Britain was incapable of carrying that off on itself, on its own at that point, and they finally turned it over to the United States, which then, in fact, succeeded. Uh, the effect of the American intervention in Greece was, in fact, precisely that. It was to wipe out the popular base of the anti-Nazi resistance, which was largely peasant and working class and communist-led, as in much of Europe, uh, and reinstated uh, the Nazi, the, uh, basically the Nazi regime, the, the Nazi collaborators. So, for example, our favorites, King... Uh, King Philip and Queen Frederica uh, had both had their childhood uh, youth, you know, they had come out of the Hitler Youth Movement and the fascist youth movement. That was their background. And this was very typical. Uh, and incidentally, if we look at the systematic intervention of the United States in the post-war world, we find this pattern uh, relived over and over again in Asia, in Europe, and elsewhere. Uh, there's nothing, uh, while what Machling says about uh, Latin America since 1961 is correct. It's only a small piece of the story, and uh, one should pay careful attention to that story and try to figure out why it's taking place. Well, we can get some insight into why it's taking place by looking a little more carefully. Uh, so, for example, not only is it true that uh, the United States has designed its military aid, and let's just keep the Latin America since 1961, the period he's describing, uh, the United States has, as he says, des uh, designed its aid towards uh, internal security, which means, uh, what was that phrase, which means exterminating the opposition and cowing sympathizers into submission. Uh, yes, it has done that. Uh, and the same is true of the whole range of aid programs. There are, in fact, a few, not many, but there have been a few studies of the nature of American aid. For example, there's a good one by a Latin Americanist named Lars Schultz, which appears in a journal called Comparative Development in January 1981, I think, uh, in which he uh, he just uh, does a, an analysis of, the, he cr tries to correlate American aid in Latin America with various characteristics of the regime uh, to which aid is going. Well, he finds out in the first place that there's no correlation at all between aid and need. Okay, there's no correlation whatsoever between need for aid and aid. That's zero. However, there is a correlation. Namely, in his words, U.S. aid tends to go disproportionately towards governments that torture their citizens. Uh, that turned out to be true. Uh, and in fact, that's a tendency that continued through the Carter period, uh, despite human right rhetoric. Uh, 
uh, human rights rhetoric, and it also included military aid as well as non-military aid. Well, you know, if you're a social scientist and you see a statistical correlation, you have to be cautious. Statistical correlation doesn't necessarily mean cause and effect. It might mean something else. And in this case, if we look a little more deeply, so, I mean, you, you know, there's one shouldn't leap to the conclusion that the United States has a sort of a, uh, a kind of a deep commitment to torturing masses of people, and that that's sort of our fundamental purpose in the world. One shouldn't leap to that conclusion despite the statistical correlation. Uh, and in fact, I think the conclusion is wrong. Uh, I don't think that's the right conclusion. I think the right conclusion is that American policy, it's, it's irrelevant to American policy, basically, whether a government tortures its population. Uh, not that the United States is unique in this respect. In fact, it's typical in this respect. Uh, then why the correlation? Well, we can find out why the correlation if we look at some other things. Uh, for example, there's a study that uh, Edward Herman and I did. It's in the book Political Economy of Human Rights, uh, which, on the one hand, in a different method than Schultz, correlates uh, aid with abuse of the population and shows the same positive correlation. But there's also another study in there which uh, compares American aid with changes in the investment climate. Uh, as measured, for example, by things like, say, ability to repatriate profits and so on. Uh, and it turns out that there there's even a closer correlation, the very good correlation between American aid to some country and improvement in the investment climate. Well, I think now you can see the explanation. Uh, American foreign policy is primarily devoted to creating a healthy situation for investment, a favorable investment climate, good opportunities for American corporations penetration of cheap labor markets, repatriation of profits, and so on. Those are the primary goals, and naturally aid will flow to countries that meet those conditions. But of course, to meet those conditions, you have to destroy unions and wipe out popular democracy and eliminate uh, uh, you know, popular forces, which might be trying to uh, turn the resources of the country towards the, its own population. If you want to have, say, if you want a country like, say, Guatemala or, or El Salvador or whatever to devote itself to production of export crops, uh, which will be, uh, for, for say, you know, run by, by American agribusiness, uh, then you have to make sure that it doesn't have uh, peasant unions which are trying to uh, change the society in such a way that it will produce uh, crops for local consumption. And if you want to have electronics factories, uh, you know, Texas Instruments is going to put together computers using uh, very cheap labor in El Salvador, you better make sure that you don't have any unions, uh, and so on across the board. It's very natural that in order to improve the investment climate, uh, one, a regime should resort to uh, torture and murder and destruction of uh, popular organizations and so on. And from those two independent correlations, we find a second one, namely the one that Lars Schultz noted. Well, there's much more to say about that, uh, but those are the kinds of things that really ought to be studied somewhere, not, not in universities. I think these things ought to be studied in elementary school. And in universities, you ought to study the hard questions, but at least they ought to be studied somewhere. Uh, well, coming back to uh, Central America, the uh, uh, extermination squads that Machling talks about, those are operating right now. Uh, and there's plenty of evidence about it. I'll just mention a few things. Uh, recently, a fact-finding mission of Pax Christi International, a Roman Catholic International Peace Organizations uh, had a fact, they, had a, they sent a fact-finding mission to Central America, they came back, they had an international press conference in Brussels, and they announced that, uh, in their phrase, uh, the, uh, that the people of El Salvador and Guatemala are victims of, quote, a deliberate policy of genocide on the part of their governments. Uh, this report, uh, they also went on to say that the systematic torture and repression has increased over the past two years namely the years of direct U.S. involvement, and they estimate that 85% of the people murdered, uh, the 85% of the murders they attribute to the armed forces and the death squads, which are, of course, closely linked to the armed forces. Well, that report from Pax Christi International merited 125 words in the New York Times on January 20th, 1981, if you look down at the bottom page. And it's important information. Recently, a little later, uh, there was testimony before Congress uh, by uh, Leonel Gomez, an interesting man. He was uh, part of the, he was the deputy to the, uh, de to, the to the head of the Institute of Agricultural Reform uh, in uh, El Salvador, a government institution sort of connected to the centrist parties. He was the deputy uh, 
He fled the country in January 1981 after the, his superior had been murdered, obviously by government-linked death squads, and after he himself noticed uh, soldiers beginning to appear outside of his apartment and recognized what was next, okay, he fled uh, and has been in the United States since. Uh, he testified before Congress just this February, and it, he uh, describes himself as having been responsible for checking the, uh, uh, what's the phrase he used, for keeping, he says, keeping track of the assassinations in areas covered by the land reform. That was one of his tasks, to keep track of the assassinations in the areas covered by the land reform for which his institution was responsible. And he says that, and he gives a, deta a detailed accounting in this congressional presentation, in which he concludes that 80% were killed by the army itself, uh, and that 1% were killed by the guerrillas, and the rest they couldn't get uh, details on. Uh, well, that's uh, also he points out that uh, it's pointless and absurd to make a distinction between the so-called death squads and the army. They're the same institution, and one can't make a distinction between them and the government. Uh, uh, it should also be mentioned in this connection, and uh, remember Machling's comments about the United States not inculcating, not insisting on human rights training, should be mentioned that the U.S. trained forces are typically at the forefront of the exterminations that Machling, the head of counterinsurgency under the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, that he compares to Himmler's SS. For example, last December in Morazan province, uh, some eight or nine hundred or more peasants were massacred in a sweep by the Atlacatl Battalion, which had just completed its U.S. training. Uh, with, incidentally, uh, emphasis on human rights instruction. Uh, they arrived in American helicopters, and they massacred maybe up to a 1,000 uh, defenseless peasants. Uh, on the walls of one house in the village, the soldiers scrolled the following, witnessed by a New York Times reporter in this case, the Atlacatl Battalion will return to kill the rest. Okay, those are the ones who had just come out of their special American human rights training. They are an elite and technically efficient battalion, and they're efficient at carrying out operations of exactly this sort. Uh, and anybody who doesn't think they're being trained for such operations must be quite ignorant of what has been happening in the world uh, for a long time. Uh, for a long time, that was December. In November, shortly before, an anthropology student at Stanford, Philippe Bourgois, who's here incidentally, uh, tried to do some field work in a border province uh, in El Salvador. And he was caught up in another sweep, which again was apparently spearheaded by this same elite division, the Atlacatl Battalion. Battalion, not division. Well, uh, he's local, and you may have heard his horrifying account of what he saw, and so I won't report it, but if you haven't, you should read it. And in fact, the version of it is coming out in monthly review this month, he tells me. The important thing about this is that we know about it by accident, because he was there, you know, he just happened to be there, so we heard about it, so therefore we hear about this massacre. Uh, the peasants who were massacred, uh, they don't show up in the statistics. You know, no, no, no evidence about them. I mean, this one case, we happen to have it because the Stanford student happened to be trying to do field work there. How many things are there like that? Well, we have no idea. Uh, there is a way to learn about what there has been for the last couple of years, uh, uh, an obvious way to learn about what's been happening in El Salvador, the best way, and that way is to go to the border regions, to go to the Honduran border regions, where tens of thousands of refugees have been trying to exist under conditions of miserable squalor and starvation and deprivation, also trying to escape from the uh, sweeps of the uh, uh, Salvador military and, and paramilitary forces which have driven them out of their villages and are now uh, harassing and killing uh, in Honduras with the cooperation of the Honduran army. That's the place to learn what's going on in inner El Salvador, areas in areas where reporters can't go, uh, even if they were to try, uh, 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 because uh, they too would be caught up in sweeps of the kind that Philippe Bourgois barely managed to escape alive from. Uh, but those peasants in the border regions, those tens of thousands, they can tell you what the real situation is in these areas. Uh, and uh, 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 it's interesting that until very recently, American reporters gave a very wide berth to these areas. Very few American reporters went to the Honduran border regions until quite recently. Now, that's incidentally not typical. Uh, so, for example, when uh, American reporters wanted to find out make some, what was going on in Pol Pot's Cambodia, which was also impenetrable, what they did was go to the border areas and talk to the refugees and lurid accounts of 
you know, horrors carried out by the Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge appeared, you know, headlines in all the press for years, largely from reports of refugees in the border regions. On the other hand, uh, in this case, the same technique has notably not been applied. People have not been going to the border regions to find out from the uh, victims themselves exactly what has been done. And you can understand why. It's better not to know the kinds of things you'll discover uh, when you go there. Uh, on the rare, uh, For example, in one rare visit, Alan Riding of the New York Times, a few weeks ago in fact, reported that virtually all the refugees were driven from their homes by army offensives. Quote, this is worse than 1932, said an 82-year-old refugee who recalled the massacre of 30,000 peasants by the army 50 years ago. In 1932, they only killed the young men. Now the army comes through and kills everyone, women, children, and old people. It makes no difference whom. Uh, in short, again, the Himmler SS. That's what you'll discover if you go to the border regions, and uh, therefore maybe better not to go. European reporters have been less reluctant about this, and in fact they have consistently been visiting the border regions and reporting uh, in the British press, for example, uh, and they have in fact exposed some of the major massacres from May 1980, which were suppressed by the American press, and I use the word suppress advisedly, for well over a year. Uh, the information was available, was suppressed, but for example, you know, it was exposed in the European press, in the French press, in the British press, and elsewhere. And these reporters, some of them, have not hesitated to uh, make comments like the ones I quoted in a general way from Maechling, referring to the actions of the Salvador government as comparable to Himmler's SS. Uh, furthermore, not just European reporters, but even a U.S. congressional delegation went there. Uh, and in February 1981, submitted a uh, report to Congress, an interesting report to Congress, uh, which again received virtually no press coverage. Uh, this was a, a, a committee headed by Gerald Studs of Massachusetts who visited the border areas uh, and they reported back what they discovered from their fact-finding mission uh, to the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Uh, they said that uh, the, they described the policy of the Salvador military as, quote, a combination of murder, torture, rape, the burning of crops to create starvation conditions, and a program of general terrorism and harassment. Uh, they then include in their congressional report, which is a public document available, you can get it from the House Foreign Affairs Committee, they include a series of sample interviews with refugees in which refugees describe uh, bombing of villages by the army, uh, mass murder of fleeing civilians, shooting at defenseless peasants from helicopters, hideous brutality, mutilation, decapitation, uh, uh, cutting people apart with bayonets, uh, tearing fetuses out of uh, mothers, and all kind of hideous uh, descriptions in detail. The press coverage was virtually zero, but of course this is a free country, so there was some press coverage. For example, in Gerald Studd's home district, uh, in Orleans, Cape Cod, the Cape Codder published a very, uh, the journal published there published a very extensive account of this. So, you know, since we have a free press, you can find these things out if you happen to read the Cape Codder from Orleans, Mass. regularly. <laughs> and if you're in uh, Barbara Mikulski's uh, district and wherever it is in Maryland, probably there too there was a report. But it was carefully excluded from the mainstream press, just as the reports by foreign observers were from the same regions. Again, better not to know these things. Well, let me give a couple of words of historical background. The crucial event of modern El Salvador history was the one to which this 82-year-old peasant referred in the quote from Alan Riding that I mentioned, namely the, the massacre, what they called the Matanza in 1932. Uh, what happened then was that there was a peasant revolt uh, in response to quite intolerable conditions of long standing, but which had been much worsened by the Great Depression. Uh, and in this revolt, about 100 people were killed, apparently, most of them soldiers. And in retaliation, something on the order of 15 to 30,000 peasants were massacred. Uh, we will never know exactly how many were massacred because the military which, took, uh, which carried it out immediately destroyed the National Archives, uh, so therefore no uh, precise records are available. Well, that was Matanza number one. The United States at that time was just standing by. Matanza number two, as many have called it, the current one is different. The United States is supervising it, which perhaps falls under the category of progress. Since 1932, uh, 
El Salvador has been, has been a police state run by a combination of the military and an oligarchy. In the 1970s, uh, very, what are, what, uh, various popular organizations uh, began to spring up, uh, peasant unions, uh, teachers unions, uh, church-based self-help organizations, and so on, a complex amalgam of those. And also in the mid-70s, there was the beginnings of guerrilla activities in response to extreme repression. Uh, the sort of hallmark of the governments in power were uh, first uh, murder and massacre, uh, and second, incredible corruption. Uh, the level is quite indescribable. Just to give one case, in 1976, in Mount Kisco, New York, uh, the El Salvador chief of poli the chief of staff of the El Salvador Army was caught by the Mount Kisco police trying to sell several million dollars of arms. Uh, which probably had been sent by the United States to American uh, criminal elements. Okay, that was the chief of staff of the Salvador Army. Uh, now, that caused, didn't make much of a fuss here, but caused kind of commotion there. Uh, recently, Leonel Gomez, who I mentioned before, uh, discussed this in a meeting in New Hampshire, uh, and uh, they didn't believe him, so they called the Mount Kisco police, and yeah, they confirmed it. And they then called the state, the local newspaper called the State Department uh, to ask them what they had to say about this. And the State Department said they had no records of it. You know, no, they, they said their records didn't go back that far. You know, not that, but anyway, they had no records of it. Well, that's uh, the, the, they then the chief of the Mount, Mount Kisco little town in New York police then was quoted as saying that he understood very well what the guerrillas were fighting for in El Salvador, and what he didn't understand was what kind of a country this is. Well, you can think about that. Uh, that's one typical example of a level of corruption which is really you know beyond description, and in fact is the counterpart to this uh, commitment to massacre and oppression, which is so typical of the, uh, uh, of the Latin American military, uh, operating under the, within a framework established by the United States, within this framework of internal security to which we have directed them and for which we have been training them. Well, uh, that carries us through till the late 70s. Uh, in uh, July 1979, the Somoza regime fell in uh, in Nicaragua, it was quite a shock in the United States. Contrary to what is commonly written now, if you look back, you'll discover that the Carter regime backed Somoza till the end of his bloody rule, till the very end, long past the point when the natural allies of the United States, namely the local business community, had turned against Somoza, largely because of his corruption. Long past that, the Carter administration still supported him, either directly or through its client states, in this case Israel, which supplied him with most of its arms. Uh, and it was only at the very end that the Carter administration realized that uh, this wasn't going to work, and they therefore tried an alternative. Well, it didn't work, and it led to a reassessment of U.S. policy. In fact, two lessons were learned from the so-called fall of Nicaragua, a liberation of Nicaragua from another point of view. First lesson was that reforms should have been instituted earlier to prevent the development of, a, an, of, of such a unified opposition. And the second lesson was that if such measures fail, the repression should be swift and violent. That was mid-1979, and both lessons were immediately applied in El Salvador. In October 1979, the brutal Romero government, which had been backed by the, the Carter administration all, all along, uh, was thrown out by a coup in which the United States was undoubtedly involved, in, wi uh, in which uh, uh, there was, uh, there was a, a mixture of moderate and other officers, including Colonel Nahano, who was speaking here recently and was one of the moderates, later kicked out and now in exile. Uh, the October 1979 coup was supposed to introduce a reformist regime which would eliminate the danger of another Nicaragua. That's the, that was the idea. Uh, well, uh, uh, the, the state terrorism continued without any let up, uh, and by January 1980, the uh, moderate junta had collapsed and power shifted back into the hands of the hardline military. Shortly after that, President Duarte came in in March, early March. Uh, he himself later conceded that at the time he became president in March 1980, in his words, the masses were with the guerrillas. Uh, he claimed a year later that that was no longer true, and he attributed the change to the uh, uh, reform measures that had been carried out by the junta. Well, I think he's probably right in saying that the situation had indeed changed, but not because of the reform measures carried out by the junta, rather because of Matanza II, because of the uh, 
uh, attack on the population, which undoubtedly traumatized large sectors of the population, uh, killed off the political leadership, and uh, destroyed the popular organizations. Again, let me say, there's nothing like a well-designed massacre to lay the groundwork for elections. We're masters in that. Uh, the, in March 1980, the land reform was introduced, uh, and along with it, at the same time, the country was placed under a state of siege, uh, and uh, the attack on the peasantry, which had always been extensive, and which, according to peasants in the border areas of Honduras, had picked up again and even extended in January 80, this really took off in March 1980, coincident with the land reform. And in fact, as an Oxfam report points out, uh, the areas of the worst repression and massacres coincided quite precisely with the areas of land reform. That, again, is not accidental. Uh, if you look over the history of so-called land reform measures in South Vietnam and the Philippines and elsewhere, which incidentally even involve the same individuals, apart from being similar plans, you find that this combination of land reform and massacre is not an unusual one. Uh, and uh, there's no time to talk about it now, but maybe it's obvious. Uh, this, uh, th th there, are, there are a parallel system of measures designed to traumatize the population and undercut opposition, on the one hand by massacre, on the other hand by mild reform, which draws off some. Uh, it's, a, you might say, a reasonable procedure, and sometimes it works. Uh, that was March 1980. Uh, uh, Carter then sent substantial military aid to Guatemala, to uh, El Salvador, uh, despite the uh, request of Archbishop Romero, who was assassinated by death squads uh, apparently organized by the man who has the leading political, is the leading political figure there now, uh, Dobison, in March 1980, uh, Romero, Archbishop Romero, nothing to do with the general, had uh, pleaded with Carter not to send military aid because he said military aid would, in his words, simply sharpen the repression. The military aid came, and in fact, a major uh, aid grant was given three days after Romero's uh, murder by the government-sponsored death squads. Uh, and uh, the, it continued in November 1980. Much of the political leadership of the opposition was wiped out in a raid on a, a Jesuit high school where they were meeting in, in El Salvador. A couple of weeks later, uh, American nuns were tortured and murdered, which caused the Carter administration to briefly withdraw aid here, though it was reinstituted shortly afterwards. That, of course, made the press and so on. Uh, that carried us through the Reagan administration, the uh, Carter administration. With Reagan, uh, uh, what, what happened? Well, first thing that happened is that Reagan continued the policy of supporting uh, the thugs and gangsters who were trying to massacre and uh, uh, suppress the pop much of the population in El Salvador to traumatize the population. He continued that and, in fact, somewhat escalated it. But there was a new twist in the Reagan policies, one new twist that distinguished it strikingly from the Carter policies. As far as, far as Carter was concerned, the Human Rights Administration, El Salvador was regarded as a sort of a local problem. The problem was to, to, to murder and torture uh, and decapitate enough peasants so that the opposition to the uh, military regime that we instituted would dissolve. That it was a local problem of just killing enough people, you know, torturing and killing enough people. The Reagan administration looked at it differently. It was raised at once to an international crisis. Uh, we weren't fighting peasants in El Salvador. We were fighting the Russians and the Vietnamese and the Ethiopians and the Cubans and so on. Uh, well, you laugh, but it's interesting that the American press did not laugh. It's an interesting story. Uh, in February 1981, this position came out sort of formally in the white paper, the famous white paper. Uh, in Europe, it was dismissed with ridicule. Uh, in the United States, however, the press adopted it virtually without question. Uh, there was virtually no question of the white paper. In fact, uh, the only questions were sort of minor technical ones as to whether the numbers were exactly correct or something. But the basic picture that uh, the United States was supporting a centrist regime with sort of lunatics on the left and right causing various problems, uh, and now we were engaged in an international conflict with the Soviet Union and its proxies throughout the world, that picture was presented virtually without qualification by the mainstream press, uh, February 1981. Uh, this changed shortly after, uh, not so shortly after. In fact, what happened after that is interesting and revealing, and there's an important message in it. Although the articulate intelligentsia, the mainstream press, accepted this picture with virtually complete obedience, interestingly, the population did not, nor has it to this day. In fact, there was a great popular 
outcry against the Reagan effort to increase military aid and, in fact, to move towards military intervention in El Salvador. It showed up in all kinds of ways. A mail to the White House, for example, was running about 10 to 1 against any military assistance to El Salvador. Uh, there were demonstrations and teach-ins and uh, uh, Tip O'Neill, the uh, House Minority Leader's office was taken over by a group of nuns. You know, you couldn't send in the police like they did with the students and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, throughout the country, there was just a big uproar. Uh, this caused the administration to retract its rhetoric a little. Uh, and shortly after, the press went along. And in fact, by June 1981, uh, the press was beginning to publish critical analyses of the white paper. And it also, interestingly, began to publish reports buried down at the end of the column about the huge massacres which had taken place over a year earlier, which prior to that had not been reported in the mainstream press. And in fact, since that time, the press reporting has been much more responsive to the facts, I wouldn't say anywhere near fully, but much more so, uh, a, a fact which has elicited enormous outrage on the part of institutions like Freedom House and others uh, which are devoted, as you might guess from their names, to suppressing freedom of expression in the United States. <laughs> Uh, but that change took place, and it took place as a result of the, of the popular response. And in fact, it's striking that uh, the efforts by the Reagan administration to, 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 to mobilize the population to support military intervention in El Salvador, clearly that's where they were going, under the standard guise of a defense of you know, our, our safety against the Russian aggressors and so on, that failed totally, and they withdrew it. Uh, why did the Reagan administration add this new twist in the first place over the Carter policies? I think that's pretty easy to figure out. And in fact, it follows almost directly from the Reagan domestic programs. After all, what are the Reagan domestic programs? Well, basically two. Uh, one is a massive transfer of resources from the poor to the rich uh, as an effort at sort of what they call trickle down and reindustrialization. That's number one. And the other is an enormous buildup in what in effect is the state sector of the economy. This is described as a conservative administration, but there's no sense of the word conservative in which that's true. In fact, it's a statist administration, which is building up state power, both in its repression of individuals, its destruction of civil liberties, and also in its buildup of, of the state sector of the economy. Well, that works. the way that works in our society is by building up a state-guaranteed market for production of high-technology waste as a subsidy to high-technology industry. That's armaments. Uh, to use the standard phrase. And that system is being built up enormously by the Reagan administration. And these two policies, the policies of uh, transferring resources to the rich uh, while cutting back social programs, which incidentally had been initiated under the Carter administration, but Reagan again accelerated, and building up the state sector of the economy by a subsidy to high technology industrial waste, those are pretty hard programs to sell to the population, especially when they're described accurately roughly in the terms in which I just described them. That would be pretty hard to sell. Uh, and there's a classic way to sell programs like that, and that is to create an external threat, you know, a major superpower which is uh, attacking us and going to destroy our freedom and going to wipe us out and so on. That's the classic means by which governments try to enact such programs. Uh, the Reagan administration didn't invent it. In fact, the Reagan programs are strikingly similar to those of the Kennedy administration back in 1960, very similar. Those uh, administrations are supposed to be at opposite ends of the political spectrum, uh, which tells you something about the actual spectrum of <laughs> politics in the country. Uh, but uh, 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 policies of this kind are predictable. And in fact, again, it's not just the United States. I mean, any government is going to do that. A government that's going to try to carry out domestic programs of that kind is going to inevitably try to construct an international confrontation and to try to mobilize the population in defense of their security and so on and so forth. And just about every foreign policy initiative of the Reagan administration has been of this type. It has been an effort to create confrontation. That was true whether it was uh, El Salvador, whether it was international terrorism, or whether it was Libya and Libyan hitmen or Nicaragua or whatever you like. Uh, they're all basically the same. Uh, and I think the reason for them lies in the domestic program. And it's very striking that they have all failed. They have all failed in the effort to mobilize the domestic population or to sort of mobilize our allies, our recalcitrant allies, to uh, rearm and so on, which we also want them to do. They've got to harm their economies as much as we harm ours if we want to remain competitive in international trade. That's also failed. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's interesting, interesting and important, 
and it tells you something about the change both in the world scene and in the United States itself over the past 20 years. Uh, the Kennedy administration faced a similar situation in 1960. In 1960, in Vietnam, the regime that we had placed in power was unable to uh, repress and control its own population despite massive state terror and violence, many, many thousands of people murdered, uh, uh, and so on. It was unable to maintain itself against domestic insurgency, uh, and the Kennedy administration was faced with the necessity of invading South Vietnam directly, uh, of military intervention. That military intervention took place in 1962. That was the year in which the American Air Force began the systematic bombardment of rural South Vietnam. That's what we call an invasion when other people do it. Uh, in an effort to drive the population into concentration camps where they could be controlled by the government we installed. That was 1962. Incidentally, uh, for those of you who are interested in the American system of indoctrination, you might look, as I have, uh, at the American press and scholarship for the past 20 years to see how many references you can find to the American invasion of South Vietnam or American aggression against South Vietnam in 1962. Well, I've found zero which is a, a, a record that any dictator would be very happy to have achieved. 20 years of suppression of the simple and obvious fact that the United States carried out an invasion of South Vietnam in 1962, later extending to the rest of Indochina a couple of years later. That event doesn't exist. It's been wiped out from history. But more crucially, at the time that Kennedy was moving towards that, there was no public opposition. Couldn't get two people together in a room to talk about Vietnam. Nobody even knew where it was. In 1981, uh, the Reagan administration was faced with a rather similar situation in El Salvador, tried the same techniques, in fact carried out a big publicity campaign well beyond what uh, Kennedy did, and they couldn't organize and mobilize the population. That tells you something, tells, tells something very important and carries a lesson. Uh, well, this American involvement in Central America is not confined to El Salvador. Uh, Guatemala is a much bigger domino and will be more, there's a major guerrilla movement going on there. There will be American military aid there pretty soon. There already is indirectly through our proxies. Uh, and also in Honduras, there's a growing American military presence. Uh, not coincidentally, death squads and disappearances have suddenly uh, been reported in Honduras for the first time, corresponding, as always, with the American military involvement. Uh, this uh, growth of the military system in Honduras is directed both at El Salvador uh, and at Nicaragua. Uh, as you know, the American government is now almost openly supporting uh, um, an attack on Nicaragua, organized in Florida and Washington and elsewhere, uh, and through Honduras. All like Vietnam in the early 1960s. Uh, the difference, the only major difference so far being that the American population is not going along. Well, the peace movement in the 1960s finally did prove effective in places like Berkeley, for example, one of the first places and most effective places, did prove effective, uh, but much too late. The time to stop the Vietnam War was in 1960. That was the time to stop it, before the direct American invasion began. And the time to stop the coming Central American War is now. And that can be done. There are opportunities to do it. Uh, and it would be really criminal to let those opportunities pass. Thank you. Yeah, you want this? We'll now have we'll now have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, we're going to have a special guest. Alexander Haig is going to show up for the question <laughs> period. Okay. Well, he couldn't make it, so Dr. Jones, we want to answer questions. There will be buckets uh, at the doors and going around for donations to education work on El Salvador here on the Berkeley campus by Think. Uh, please give generously. Um, 
Maybe it would be good if questioners would stand up because I think it's going to be hard to hear. Hi, my name is Carter Rose from San Francisco. And uh, what I'm interested in knowing some about, I read the, uh, I think the January, February issue of Science for the Hebrew magazine. And in there was a discussion of the semantic differential tool that Fred Landis. Uh, I'm interested in your reflections on the extent to which you see that tool being used here in this country, and as per your early remarks in your talk today. And also, uh, could you reflect some on the so called information war that seems to be going on within war? The information? Information war. Meaning? Different factions in Washington are fighting wars with information within the city. Yeah. Could you hear the question? No. Yeah, well, let me repeat. There was an article in Science for the People and also somewhere else, Progressive or somewhere, by Fred Landis uh, in January, did you say? Early this year, yeah. Uh, in which uh, Fred Landis is uh, uh, a man who wrote a very extremely interesting dissertation at the University of Illinois on, uh, uh, on the CIA and control of the press in uh, Latin America. He, I think, as I recall, he wrote primarily about Chile the way the CIA had, uh, the devices that were used, the propaganda devices, the, uh, you know, the, the advert, the PR devices, the subliminal, et cetera, the whole system that was used uh, to try to uh, help uh, control and indoctrinate the population in Chile through the press uh, just prior to the American-backed coup, which did in Chile what, well, you know. Uh, and he, this article was about, uh, I think, about, Nic about uh, Nicaragua, actually, if I recall. Yeah, I think he was writing, he was claiming that the same techniques are now being used, uh, he said, by the CIA in Nicaragua. Uh, and he mentioned, and this was what the question was about, that a device that is developed by a, um, a uh, psychologist at the University of Illinois named Charles Osgood called the Semantic Differential was being, which he said, I think, had been in part funded by... I don't know, CIA or somebody, I forget who he said, uh, was, according to him, being used as one of the devices in, in this uh, work. I mean, and you asked my opinion. Well, my opinion was that uh, the business about the semantic differential, I thought, was off the wall, frankly. I mean, probably the CIA or anybody will try to use whatever they can, but if they can get any mileage out of the semantic differential, they're a lot better than anyone else has been. Uh, I don't think you can find out anything from it. And Char Charles Osgood, the guy who did it, uh, I, I thought it was a little unfair, uh, to put it mildly, for Landis to imply that Osgood was either passively or actively working for the CIA or anything like it. He's a very decent person, and I don't think that's true at all. Furthermore, I think that you know, while the government will undoubtedly try to make whatever use it can of anything that's done, uh, they're not going to get far with the semantic differential, which is a, it's a way of testing attitudes and things, but I don't think it tells you much. On the other hand, I thought his general thesis was very plausible, both in the, uh, in the article and even more so in his thesis. Uh, the United States does have a very sophisticated system of mind control. Uh, the, it's more so than in any other country in the world. We have developed the advertising and public relations industries, and these are huge industries. Uh, there's even an ideology that justifies their use, and it's a mainstream ideology in the social sciences. Uh, the ideology that is what Walter Lippmann once called the manufacture of consent. Others have called the engineering of consent. The idea is, and this is a mainstream position in the social sciences, that in a democracy, uh, the voice of the people is heard. It's not like a dictatorship where you can just sort of beat them over the head. Their voice is heard, but since plainly the you know, the unwashed masses don't understand what's good for them. What you have to, what the intellectual elite, the advanced elite has to do is to ensure that the voice of the people says the right thing. Since they're too stupid to say it to understand themselves, we who know these things will arrange so that they say the right things. And that's what the public relations industry is for, and that's what the advertising system is for. And it's a huge business. It penetrates schools, textbooks, uh, media, uh, etc., and it'd be extremely surprising if an organization like, say, the CIA were not to exploit its achievements, and they are not small, uh, in third world countries, and I'm sure they're doing it, and I think Landis's description of this is probably quite accurate. Outside the sceptics, you might consider the trying to stop the generation war. Now, when you're talking about to stop the, the United which to stop what now the intervention or intervention. intervention. 
Well, I think we all know basically what has to be done. I mean, what was done too late, but effectively in the 60s, at places like Berkeley. I mean, uh, pressure on congressmen, for example. Pressure on Congress is very significant. You know, there's going to be a congressional election in, in a couple of months, and there should be, there, there's an, you know, if, if you look at polls and attitude studies, I think it's plain that there's enormous opposition throughout the country to military intervention or any kind of involvement in repression in Central America. For example, one recent poll really amazed me. It indicated that uh, a majority of, the, uh, literally a majority of the population now would support resistance if American uh, soldiers were ordered to go to Central America. There was nothing like that during the Vietnam War. Nobody, you know, the, the number of people supported resistance was minuscule. Now it's over half the population. Something like seven out of ten people want to have no American involvement in Central America. Well, these are forces that can be organized and mobilized by a range of devices that range from sitting in at your congressman's office to civil disobedience. You know, a whole range, they're all there. Uh, the only thing is to make use of them. Uh, and I, I think that uh, it has already, it's been effective, you know. It has been effective so far in preventing direct American intervention. In the case of Guatemala, uh, where a vicious uh, massacre of the population has been going on for years, the, Reg the Carter administration was prevented by congressional pressure. This is always called the Carter human rights policy, but remember it was a congressional human rights policy that Carter tried to exploit and sort of to overcome and had to more or less abide by. Uh, and. Uh, that did succeed in blocking military aid to El Salvador, direct American military aid. We didn't block aid through our proxies, Israel being the main one in this case. But direct American military aid was blocked. The Reagan administration is trying to reinstitute it, and the human rights groups in Washington have so far succeeded in blocking them. Well, they're not going to succeed forever, certainly not without a lot of support, and that support can be mobilized. Uh, one subcommittee, uh, for the, Don, the Bonker Committee, I think, has succeeded so far in blocking... Uh, military aid to El Salvador, which is strictly illegal. I mean, you're not allowed to give aid to regimes by law which are suppressing their population. And if, El if Guatemala isn't doing it, then the concept doesn't have any meaning. You know. uh, uh, so here it's a matter, it's not a matter of taking a very radical position, it's taking the position that the American government ought to live up to the law. You know. uh, and I think it's possible to uh, build up a big popular support for that position. Small groups have been doing it with some success in Washington, and they could use support. And this support, as I say, can be of any kind, you know, going from writing a letter to your congressman to appearing at, his, at, the, at the office of the Congress of, of, of senators and representatives to, uh, uh, to, to going after the press, you know, which tells a totally deceitful story on most of these things and is responsive to pressure, uh, all the way over to civil disobedience. You know, it's a matter of what uh, measures you decide are the ones that, satisfy, that meet your sense of what ought to be done, but there are plenty of them available. Well, the qu question, which is a long and interesting one, had to do with the nature of the institutions, not just in the United States now, but all the way back, that uh, tried to distort people's essential ethical sense in such a way that it will support the kind of oppression that we carry out while opposing the kind of oppression that the bad guys, whoever our enemies are that day, they carry out. Are they sort of functionally the same throughout history? Well. Uh, some level of abstraction, yes, but there are a lot of historical particularities. Uh, 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 
I mean, the, it's true that every major imperial power has developed such a system, uh, and they're different. I mean, when we read about the white man's burden, you read Kipling now, it looks ridiculous. One of, one of my son, who's 15, had to read Kipling in school, and he thought it was a satire. Well, you know, it wasn't a satire. Uh, it, it, but it's very hard now to read, you know, these poems about the white man's burden and to believe that they're not a satire. They weren't. Okay. Now, we have more sophisticated devices, uh, which scholarship and the media go along with and participate in eagerly, but they're not all that different. You know, they're only different in level of sophistication. Yeah. The literal question is that I'm putting is that do you agree that all of the major dogmatic systems in the world today all the major dogmatic systems are oppressive? Sure. Yeah, yeah, undoubtedly. Look, any institution you like is oppressive. There's not much question about that in different ways. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I think there are parallels, and I think it's worth pursuing them. Again, I think there are particularities. Oh, there are many parallels. For example, the, the one, one of the striking parallels is silence. Uh, much of the oppression in the world is simply silence that we're engaged in. Uh, it, it never enters into the, into the consciousness of the population, and one of the main purposes and techniques of the propaganda system, and I would include here the schools and the media and everything, is to try to keep people's attention deflected away from things which, if they look at them, are going to lead to, uh, uh, to, to opposition and protest. And, well, the examples that you mentioned are cases in point. I think that a very small percentage of the American population has any idea of what goes on in prisons or what's being done, say, to Native Americans. Uh, for, well, I mean, just to give you some numbers, let's start with that. Uh, the uh, Current estimates by, I mean, actually there's some specialists here who can probably improve this, but the, at Berkeley, but as I understand, the current estimates for the Native American population at the time of Columbus, north of the Rio Grande, that is just our side, is in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 million. Uh, in the year 1900, there was a census, uh, and there were 200,000. Okay, that's real, that's protracted genocide, but genocide nevertheless, of an enormous, on an enormous scale. When you go to Latin America, it's not very different. Uh, there was recently a careful study done of Peru, which concluded that I forget the exact numbers, but I think that they concluded that the pre-Columbian population of maybe 10 to 20 million was reduced again to maybe a million or so uh, later. In Argentina, the native population was just wiped out, and so on across the uh, across the region. Well, that's not part of our history, you know. That's not part of the history that we study and internalize and think about and do anything with. And that carries over to the treatment of Native Americans today. Let me just take, about, take the jails, the other thing you mentioned. Again, nobody has, really has any, unless you've been in jail, you just don't have any idea what goes on there. Now, I've been in a couple of times on both sides, but just let me tell you, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I went to visit a prisoner, uh, Kathy Boudin, in fact, as some of you may know or remember, in a New York jail. And uh, uh, the store and the, the treatment is, you know, the treatment is unbelievable. I mean, Kathy, who's a white woman, uh, is, has been under, and that's crucial to the story, has been put, placed on, she's been in jail now for I think four months with no charges pressed yet, and she has in effect been in solitary confinement the whole time. Uh, that's, uh, this went on for two months in a New York prison. Finally her lawyers, she has high class lawyers and so on, got the, took it to court, and the court, the judge, uh, made a strong and very good statement in which he said that her treatment was, 
cruel and unusual punishment, unconstitutional, that they had to put her into the normal prison population. Well, before the court decision was handed down, uh, the state authorities shipped Kathy out to a, an all-male institution uh, in central New York, where, in effect, she's, under, uh, she's back in solitary confinement. Okay, in violation of the court order. Well, nothing can be done about it. That's the she's a white woman. Okay, there are two black men in the same group. Uh, one of them was uh, they're not just in solitary confinement. One of them was beaten so badly un, in, under interrogation that his neck was broken, and he was then uh, not permitted to see a doctor for a couple of months. While every day FBI agents came and slapped him around and beat him up with his neck broken. That's a black man. Another black man was uh, beaten so badly in his case that uh, uh, he had to be taken to uh, an intensive care unit in, uh, uh, in, a, in a hospital uh, just to keep him alive. Uh, this actually made it to the New York Times, which had a phrase like, uh, one of the prisoners complains of stomach pains, I think was their phrase, or something like that. According to their reports, uh, the, uh, his toenails were ripped out, and you know, in fact, the whole story of sort of Latin American style torture. Okay. Now, I can't swear that that's true. I saw the black prisoner walking around with a neck brace and said it's true, but, you know, I wasn't there. Uh, but how many reports of that kind do we hear about prisons? Well, all you have to do is touch a prison, and you immediately find cases of that kind. Uh, any, I mean, I, I was once in, a, in, the, in, in Jackson, Mississippi, in a, uh, the, uh, at the time of one of the civil rights demonstrations, a group of New England professors we were asked by SNCC to go down and sort of monitor it or try to try to get some publicity or to cut back the uh, level of police violence or something or other. And in the course of this, we went through a prison uh, with the police chief, since we were sort of white, respectable professors with ties and so on. The police chief took us through. And uh, it, it, was, it was amazing. It was, by, by the standards of most prisons, say the Washington cell block, it was quite, you know, quite decent, in fact, magnificent. Uh, but the things you found are astonishing. For example, we were walking past a... Uh, big cell with lots and lots of people in it, and uh, there were men, black, all black, you know, uh, in, in this Jackson prison, and uh, there was a little kid there, looked maybe 10 years old, who knocked on the bars as we walked past and asked uh, if uh, I could get him a drink. He asked me if I could get him a drink of water, so I turned to the police chief and said, can I get him a drink of water? And he said, yeah, so I brought him a drink of water. When we got back to the chief's office, uh, I asked him, uh, what is that 10-year-old kid doing in the jail, you know, with these male prisoners? Uh, grown-up prisoners, and he said he didn't know, and he asked some clerk to check, and it turned out that the kid had been picked up on the streets a couple of weeks earlier, and nobody could figure out what to do with him, so they decided to put him in jail, you know, and he'll spend the rest of his life there, you know. Well, how many cases of that kind are there? You know, all you have to do is just begin to touch these institutions, just begin, you know, to take a look, and you find stories of such, you know, degradation and horror that it really makes your skin crawl, you know. These things people don't know about. Very hard to find out about. Yeah, a couple more. Yeah. Okay. I want to make one announcement about that earlier. Tomorrow afternoon, the uh, week of social responsibility continues. There'll be a rally at noon with Bert Corona, and then a forum from 1 to 6 in Zellerbach with I.S. Stone, Nalchonsky, Phil Whedon, Arnon Hadar, Lillian Rabinowitz, and Bert Corona. Five more minutes. Five more. I'll try to be briefer in comment. Yeah. All of it's about, it's really horrible. And I mean, it's just a, 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 a time of, a time of horror that we're addressing here. And uh, the point is, this country supposedly has laws from the Constitution on down that prohibit all this stuff. And in fact, the Constitution uh, says, as a very simple uh, case for impeachment, and that is, of course, as you, you know, that anybody, any high official, president included, who uh, is guilty of uh, high treason or malfeasance or misdemeanor that uh, can be impeached. Now, of course, this type of a thing, impeachment is, is not uh, really a possible, but I would suggest that this green impeachment, this is a psychological effect to people who don't have the opportunity to listen to you, uh, would be a very good thing to get other people to know that there is, there are legitimate reasons to get rid of this illegitimate person mm -hmm. and his problem.
Yeah, well, that might, you might be right. I mean, maybe impeachment is a good device to think about and to organize about, but let me just make a comment on the more general, brief comment on the more general point. You say correctly that this is a country that does have laws that prevent these things. And in fact, we're lucky we live in a country that at least has laws, you know. However, I'd like to make, I wish I could get the exact wording because it was rather nice, but one of my favorite, one of the best, greatest modern political scientist, so good that he's never studied in a university, uh, Rudolf Rocker, an anarchist thinker, once pointed out back in the late 30s that, uh, maybe somebody can remember his exact words, which are better than I will, but he said, laws exist not because they're written down on paper, but because people are willing to struggle to see them enforced. You know? they, they don't come into existence unless you struggle to bring them into existence, and they're not enforced unless you you defend yourself and you see that they're enforced by constant struggle. That's true. Better said by him than by my rendition. And that's the meaning of the laws. You know, they'll exist if we're forcing them to be enforced, otherwise not. I mean, there's laws. It's illegal for, the, for any country, including any, any signatory to the UN chart, to the United Nations, including us. Uh, it's illegal. In fact, it's part of our supreme law of the land that the use, of, the use or threat of force in international affairs is illegal. Well, okay, you know, I mean, just take a look at Vietnam for 20 years. It was illegal, but it wasn't illegal because there wasn't enough popular force to make it illegal, that is to force those laws to be, in, to, to be applied. I'd like to ask sort of the opposite question to the gentleman, and that is, uh, it seems to me that there's much greater sophistication in public manipulation since Vietnam. How much further will we have to go in our tactics than we went then? Well, uh, you're right. There is plenty of sophistication and manipulation since Vietnam, and it has been very effective in certain sectors of the whole population. In particular, it's been overwhelmingly effective among the intelligentsia. In fact, the whole history of the Vietnam War, in my opinion, has been wiped out of the intellectual record in the media and in scholarship. It just doesn't exist anymore. But I don't think it's been effective for the population. Uh, that's striking. There is this thing called the Vietnam Syndrome, terminology is interesting. It's supposed to be some kind of sickness. You know, the Vietnam syndrome is the unwillingness of the, on the part of much of the population to support atrocity and massacre, de de dread disease that we have to overcome. Well, it was very successfully overcome in the halls of the universities and in the mass media and, the, you know, the editorial offices and so on, but it plainly was not overcome among the population at large. That's why everyone was so surprised, or everyone who, you know, who believes the kind of things they read in newspapers about the uh, reaction to the El Salvador story. Uh, so yes, the techniques are more sophisticated and in some sectors they work, but it's nevertheless true, I think, that the population as a whole is much more skeptical. You know, much more skeptical and much less willing to simply accept sort of doctrinal, the, doc the doctrines of the faith than it was 20 years ago. Uh, you might, how about the Reagan mandate? Doesn't that show that the country is more conservative? I don't think so, not if you look carefully. First of all, there was no Reagan mandate. A very small percentage of the population, maybe 10% or something, voted for Reagan's programs, if you look at the, uh, at the actual statistics. Very small. You know, some good studies of this. Uh, the, first of all, Reagan altogether got, a, I think, 27% of the vote, and of that, most of it was an anti-Carter vote, when you, it was just sort of get the bastards out. You know, that was, that was the vote. And this kind of vote, corresponds to a regular and systematic decline in trust and faith in all institutions. Now, what that means is very hard to know. It could mean all sorts of things. Uh, it, could be the, it could be an indication that a demagogue could arise and could use, exploit that as a mass base for fascism. It could, on the other hand, be a basis for real effective opposition to oppressive institutions and their operations. Depends what people do with it. Uh, somebody back there, yeah. Well, I can't talk about Berkeley because I just don't know, but I'm sure people here can. As far as I myself am concerned, uh, well, I mean, you know, I'm an upper middle class white male in a privileged and protected position. Therefore, I'm not a target for state terrorism in the United States, okay? Uh, I'm a target for things that don't matter, like being vilified in journals and so on. All of that stuff matters if you care about the people who are writing the articles. But if you have the same contempt for them that they have for you, it doesn't matter. You know? <laughs> <laughs>
Last question, I was just told. Regarding the difficulty in South Dakota and Vietnam, uh, I, was, I was wondering, what do you say that the historical context that is occurring today Yeah. So the question is whether the strategic significance of places like, say, El Salvador and the Horn of Africa, uh, in the context of the superpower confrontation leading to possibly nuclear war, whether that significantly changes the situation. That's basically it. I, I don't think so. I think most of that's fraud. Uh, I don't think El Salvador plays any role in any strategic confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. In con on the contrary, I think what has happened, and unfortunately, I think the disarmament movement has a little bit been caught up in this propaganda, uh, each of the superpowers appeals to the alleged threat of the rival as a way of mobilizing its own population for the uh, acts of repression and intervention that it's going to carry out in its own domains. So when we want to murder peasants in El Salvador in the, the, the beauty of the Cold War system is that we can appeal to the fact that Russia is brutal and repressive and barbaric as it is, and somehow that enables us to massacre people in El Salvador because somehow we're defending something against them. That's the Cold War system. When they, say, invade Afghanistan or Czechoslovakia, same. They're defending people against uh, the international violence of a major superpower enemy which has an enormous record of barbarism and destruction, namely us. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think the reason this system persists is because it's so useful for the superpowers as a way of justifying the depredations that they're going to carry out in their own domains, but we shouldn't be trapped by it. I and mean, this has been going on in the United States since 1947. It's not now. When the Truman Doctrine was announced, and under the Truman Doctrine, we decided to move into Greece with the consequences I briefly mentioned, that was presented to the American people as a defense against the Soviet Union. The Soviet threat was just about 100% manufactured. Not that the Soviet Union isn't a brutal and repressive power. Of course it is, but not in Greece. You know. Uh, it was, nor were they threatening American power in Greece at all, even if that were relevant. Uh, and th that's been the history all the way through by both superpowers. When the Russians sent tanks into East Berlin in 1953, they just reversed the story. They were defending the Germans against West German imperialism, backed by the United States, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the important thing about those propaganda systems, so far at least, is that they've worked largely. The Russian population, as far as we know, believes these stories and therefore supports its own government uh, in its quite barbaric actions. And, you know, we shouldn't, our, our sort of uh, contempt for totalitarian systems, which is undoubtedly justified, may be somewhat modulated when we recognize that exactly the same thing works here and very effectively without state violence. What do you say from the perspective of the ruling class of the Muslim countries, namely the imperialism of the Soviet Union? Not, no, I mean, the threat of the Soviet, we, the Soviet Union does not threaten our interests crucially, except, whose? I mean the ruling class. No, it doesn't. I mean, our, the interests of the American ruling class are threatened more by Europe than by the Soviet Union. Take, say, Saudi Arabia. And by, take a place like Saudi Arabia. What threatens America? We, we have a rapid deployment force aimed at Saudi Arabia. Now, the rhetoric says it's defending it against the Russians. But the fact of the matter is it's defending it against the indigenous population and against European intervention, which may beat us out for a contract. The Russians aren't going to have nothing to do with Saudi Arabia and aren't expected to.